In 2017, a paper was published in the journal Mediterranean Archaeology and Archaeometry, which presented evidence that the zoomorphic carvings at the megalithic site of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey may depict constellations. Not only that, the paper went a step further and suggested that the configuration of the constellations on Pillar 43 in Enclosure D can be dated to the beginning of the Younger Dryas period. This was a strange time when the Earth suddenly dropped in temperature, even though it had been warming prior to that as it emerged from the last glacial maximum of the most recent ice age. Many researchers think the Younger Dryas period could have been initiated by a comet strike. So, for the authors of this paper, it's the comet strike which was commemorated by later generations on Pillar 43. In this video, I discuss the details of this paper as well as the response article brought out in the same journal a little later that year by archaeologists who've worked at Gobekli Tepe. Do we have constellations represented at Gobekli Tepe? And do they commemorate a catastrophic occurrence in human history? Let's get into it. Let's start by looking at the history of constellations, including the zodiac. It's not clear how far back in time people started equating clusters of stars with images of animals, humans, and shapes, but it probably goes back far into prehistory. The earliest references to constellations are in Mesopotamian sky maps, going back as far as 3200 BCE. These developed over time, eventually becoming part of later Babylonian star catalogues. Some of these then passed down through history to the ancient Greeks. In the 3rd century BCE, the Greek didactic poet Aratus included 48 Western constellations in his text Phenomena. These were also listed by Ptolemy in his Almagest a few hundred years later. The zodiac, which refers to the constellations that cross the ecliptic, probably dates back to Babylonia and around 400 BCE. Of course, the images associated with the star clusters have changed over time, and the stars included in a particular cluster have also varied, depending on the culture and time period. If constellations had also been associated with images of animals, humans, and shapes in prehistory, then it's entirely possible that some of these early correlations did come down to us over the years, and that traces of them can still be found in our modern-day constellations, including the zodiac. So the hypothesis that constellations may have been represented at Gobekli Tepe, a megalithic site dating back to around 9600 BCE, does not seem that wild in principle. Now I'm going to do my best to cover the key points in this paper by Martin Swetman and Dimitrios Sikritsis. I know that other YouTube channels have covered it in the past, but I honestly find them quite confusing. So I'm laying out the information as simply as I can. My design work is not great. It's not pretty and it's not fancy. It's not meant to be. I've just tried to be as clear as possible. They weren't the first researchers to notice that Pillar 43 might depict constellations. Paul Burley had brought out an article about this in 2013, and it was his work that was mentioned in Graham Hancock's Magicians of the Gods. But Swetman and Secretsis took the concept further and were the first researchers to publish this information in a peer-reviewed journal. Let's start with Pillar 43 in Enclosure D. This is the carved pillar known in some circles as the Vulture Stone, which, according to this particular hypothesis, may be the date stamp for an ancient catastrophe. The paper also goes on to discuss other carvings at Gobekli Tepe, but I'll look at this one first. Pillar 43 is located in the northwest wall of Enclosure D. It's one of 11 such pillars embedded in the wall, and two other large megaliths stand in the center of the enclosure. The bottom central relief carving is referred to in the paper as the head of a bird, which could be a duck, a goose, or a swan. To the right of this carving is a headless man with an erect penis. Right in the centre of the bottom half of the pillar is a very clear carving of a scorpion. To the left of the scorpion, a partial relief of a dog or a wolf can be seen. Moving upwards, we come to a vulture or eagle with outstretched wings, a circular ball resting on its left one. To the right of the vulture sits another bird, possibly a crane or a flamingo. A snake or fish pointing downwards is further to the right, and another smaller bird sits underneath this. 
two H symbols, which look rather like dumbbells, are positioned to the right of the snake or fish. One is horizontal and the other is vertical. At the very top of the pillar sit three rectangles topped with arches, sometimes referred to as handbags, and three more carvings of animals which are quite difficult to make out. There are also some decorative V-shapes in between the vulture and the crane. In the paper, the authors suggest that the scorpion carving represents the constellation Scorpius. I guess the only problem with this would be that its orientation is wrong. But as they mentioned, it was probably meant to be symbolic rather than an actual sky map. They suggest that the vulture represents the teapot asterism from the constellation Sagittarius and that the crane, along with the downward facing fish, represent the constellations of Phiocus and Serpents. The goose is equated with Libra, which historically has at times been represented as a vulture with folded wings rather than scales. The partial carving of a dog or a wolf is correlated with the constellation Lupus. In keeping with the sky map theme, the authors think that the ball resting on the vulture's wing might represent the sun, and this is where it gets interesting. If the carvings do represent the constellations as presented in the paper, and the ball does represent the sun, then due to the procession of the equinoxes, this particular configuration will have appeared at certain times in history only. Using the Stellarium software, the authors were able to work out dates when the sky appeared this way. These dates were the spring equinox of 18,000 BCE, the summer solstice of 10,950 BCE, the autumnal equinox of 4,350 BCE, and the winter solstice of 2000 CE. Since Gobekli Tepe dates to around 9,600 BCE, then the closest prehistoric date of these four is the summer solstice of 10,950 BC. Of course, it's still more than 1,000 years before the construction of Gobekli Tepe. But since this coincides with the beginning of the Younger Dryas period, which may have been caused by an immense natural disaster, it's reasonable to think that the date was commemorated by future generations. I guess that in those intervening years, it could have been commemorated in oral traditions or in a physical way that has not come to light yet. During 10,950 BC, the sun was in Virgo on the spring equinox and Gemini on the winter solstice. It was in Pisces a year earlier on the winter equinox. The paper suggests that the arched rectangles at the top of the pillar represent these equinoxes and the solstice, which precede the summer solstice represented by the date stamp on the rest of the pillar. In their interpretation, the arch is the half disk of the sun and the rectangle is the horizon. Furthermore, the small animal carvings between the arches represent the constellations that acted as the sun's backdrop during those times. The first carving is thought to be a bending bird, which could represent Pisces. The second carving, which looks like a four-legged animal, could be a charging ibex and may correlate with Gemini. The third carving, which may be a downward crawling frog, could represent Virgo. For the H symbols, the authors put forward the idea that they may represent Vega and or Deneb, since both stars would have appeared to the right of the serpent's constellation, correlated with the snake carving, around 10,950 BCE. Deneb was the pole star around 16,000 BCE, and Vega was the pole star around 12,000 BCE, so it's possible they held significance to the ancient people who participated in rituals at Gobekli Tepe. The decorative V-shapes in the pillar are suggested as being some sort of counting system in the paper, probably related to astronomy, but the authors aren't sure what exactly they may have been counting. After pillar 43, the authors move on to pillar 18, which sits in the middle of enclosure D, and is carved with a fox, belt buckle with symbols and a necklace. They think it's possible that the U-shapes in the belt buckle depict the bow shockwave of a hypersonic spherical object. This was first suggested by Andrew Collins in 2014, and is in line with the idea that pillar 43 in the same enclosure is a date stamp marking a catastrophic comet strike that initiated the Younger Dryas period. Since the researchers suggest that the dumbbell or H symbols on pillar 43 are stellar representations, they extend this idea to the H symbols on the belt buckle. The necklace is made up of a crescent and a circle, which the authors think might indicate a solar eclipse or an obscuration of the sun due to ash caused by a comet hit. 
The author suggests the fox is also indicative of a constellation, just as the animal carvings on pillar 43. However, this one is a little more difficult to interpret. They look at other examples of fox symbolism at Gobekli Tepe. Pillar 2 in enclosure A has carvings of an uruk, a fox and a crane. Pillar 38 in enclosure D has carvings of an uruk, a boar and a crane. The authors find, using Stellarium, that there may be a connection between these carvings, if they are constellations, and the torrid meteor stream during the time Gobekli Tepe was in use. Stellarium shows that the northern torrid meteor shower would have travelled through Capricornus, northern Aquarius and Pisces in 9530 BCE and the southern torrid meteor shower would have traveled through Capricornus, southern Aquarius and Pisces. So the author suggests that the crane represents Pisces, the auroch represents Capricornus and the fox and boar represent northern and southern Aquarius respectively. To take this idea to its natural conclusion, the authors then return to the fox carving on pillar 18 and suggest it correlates to the northern taurids. Since some researchers think that if a comet did initiate the Younger Dryas period, it may have originated in the taurid meteor stream, then this might also explain why those who participated in rituals at Gobekli Tepe were so interested in referencing it. Gobekli Tepe is replete with snake symbolism. The paper suggests these snakes may represent death and destruction, as in later mythology in other cultures. But they also put forward the less abstract notion that the snakes may depict a meteor track. In the appendix of the paper, the authors include a statistical test for their hypothesis. It's an open access paper if you want to read more about it. I've put information in the description below. Overall, it's an interesting idea. My first thought when I read this paper years ago was how does this hypothesis stand up when we look at the rest of the animal symbolism that Gobekli Tepe is absolutely covered in? Andrew Collins has also put forward his own interpretation of Pillar 43 and various alignments within Enclosure D, but I think he equates the vulture with Cygnus. The alignments of ancient monuments are often difficult to interpret because of multiple phases of remodeling. Gobekli Tepe was restructured extensively during the time it was in use, and pillars were moved from their original locations to new ones. However, there are some intriguing elements in Andrew Collins' hypothesis as well as the response articles to it, so I will get into that another time. Archaeologists who have worked at Gobekli Tepe wrote a response paper entitled More Than a Vulture, a response to Sweatman and Sigkritsis. Let's run through that now. Their first point is that the significant amount of archaeological research published about the site is barely referred to in Sweatman and Sigkritsis' paper. They also discuss the fact that the enclosures were most likely roofed, which would have limited their role as observatories. I don't think Sweatman and Secretes necessarily think the observations were made inside the enclosures, but I could be wrong. Anyway, um, the earliest radiocarbon dates for Gobekli Tepe are roughly the same as the end of the Younger Dryas period. So for Pillar 43 to commemorate the beginning of the Younger Dryas period, almost a millennium earlier, is seen as a little far-fetched in this response paper. In any case, the archaeologists also mention that the idea of a comet strike having initiated the Younger Dryas period is still debated by scientists with evidence to both support and refute the hypothesis. They also raise the point that constellations may not have been viewed in the same way more than 11,000 years ago as they were during the much later classical period. As I had observed, they also think the hypothesis is tested on too small an area, considering that there are more than 60 T-pillars at the site, many of which have animals and symbols carved into them. Similar iconography is also found on stone vessels, plaquettes and shaft straighteners, not to mention that animal symbolism is also present at many contemporary sites across the region. Pillar 43 itself has decorated narrow sides which are left out of the interpretation. There's also the rather intriguing fact that each enclosure seems to focus on one type of animal more than another. Enclosure D has more birds than anything else. Uh, just Pillar 43 is indicative of that. Enclosure A emphasizes snakes. Enclosure B focuses on foxes. And in Enclosure C, boars are represented more than any other animal. 
This may indicate that each enclosure was looked after by a different group with the animals being emblematic of that particular community. In this context, experts have also suggested that the arches sitting on rectangles in Pillar 43 might be depictions of the enclosures, especially since an animal is associated with each one. The paper concludes by discussing the complexity of pre-pottery Neolithic iconography, which centers on, to quote, the articulation and disarticulation of the human body. Necrophagous animals such as vultures also predominate. So it's likely that the iconography is related to mortuary rituals which took place there. Personally, I think there's a lot of evidence for the Younger Dryas impact hypothesis. I also think that there's a possibility that constellations are represented at Gobekli Tepe, but I'm not sure the paper has found the right ones. And I think the three date stamps are a bit of a stretch too. I just think that if we start to go down the astronomical route, then it needs to apply throughout the whole site. And I can't see that right now. Some of these other carvings just don't seem to follow such a pattern. But the idea is very clever, and I would love for more evidence to come up that supports it. It's most likely that mortuary rituals did take place at Gobekli Tepe, as mentioned by the archaeologists. They found a lot of evidence for that. I did a video about the possibility of a skull cult, and I also talked about how there's strong evidence that alcohol was drunk during rituals. Since the site was in use for a long time and remodeled repeatedly, it was clearly a significant meeting place for the community that built it. And in my opinion, if we start talking about mortuary rituals, then it's entirely possible that the ancient inhabitants of the region had a complex belief system which also included a sky earth cosmology. Why not? I don't think these ideas are mutually exclusive, but it doesn't necessarily mean that their sky earth cosmology included depictions of constellations as animals. But I think any hypothesis needs to take into account the relationship of Gobekli Tepe with other similar sites in the region as well. Part of me thinks, and this is pure speculation, that it was a multi-purpose site. Perhaps it was meant for rituals, those of the living and the dead, such as fertility rites and funerary ceremonies before the body was moved elsewhere. But perhaps it was also a place where people learned about the natural world, especially in the context of hunting and gathering, which was still a feature of society at the time. Maybe that's what the animals represent. Maybe in the snake enclosure, they learned how to avoid getting poisoned. Maybe in the bird enclosure, they learned how to follow migratory patterns. Who knows? But maybe we've missed the purpose altogether. By the way, I don't personally think that the round ball on the vulture's wing is the sun because it's rarely been depicted like that in history. It always had rays or a halo or something. I read somewhere that experts think it's either the head of the headless man at the bottom of the pillar or an egg belonging to one of the birds depicted. I don't know. If the ancients could see us now, they would probably say no. Those arches did not represent enclosures. No, we did not depict constellations. No, we did not meet in communities using animals as our emblems. We just liked carving interesting things while modifying human schools for artistic reasons and drinking alcohol. You future people are really overthinking it. But I'm always saying that the ancients probably did have a written language. Maybe it doesn't look how we expect it to. The layouts of their megalithic buildings and their carvings maybe tell us more than we realize, but like any code, we are missing the key to interpret it. I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button. Thank you to my patrons and channel members. You are amazing. And I love catching up on the conversation threads that you start. Have a good day or night, wherever you are, and I'll see you next time.